Good morning. I'm Simeon Baum, president of Resolve Mediation Services, mediators.com, uh, former chair of the Joint Committee on Fee Disputes and Conciliation, and current member of the uh, Part 147 Board of Governors. In the late 1990s, when Part 137 was promulgated, the Joint Committee on Fee Disputes and Conciliation, a, a three-bar panel, City Bar, New York County Lawyers Association, and, and Bronx County Bar Association, was hosted by the New, New York County Lawyers Association. We used that panel enhanced by newly minted commercial division mediators uh, as the basis for NYCLA's Part 137 panel. And when presenting fee dispute arbitration panel trainings like this one over the years, a centerpiece of our morning was a lecture by Professor Lester Brickman on the law of fee dispute arbitration. Today, I'm stepping into the shoes of Professor Brickman to present a condensed consideration of the question of what goes on in the mind of the arbitrator when engaged in a fee dispute arbitration. What's, what are our core considerations? What guides our decision-making process? What standards do we apply? And to address the central question of what's a reasonable fee? We've included Professor Brickman's authoritative article on this subject in your program materials, and you're encouraged to review it and to turn to it as a resource, triggering your own reflections throughout the course of your practice as arbitrators. So for start, taking a broad look at the arbitration process, what is it that we do as arbitrators? Well, arbitration, which dates back to the Phoenician merchants thousands of years ago, was seen as a place where the arbitrator does substantial justice. Arbitrators are called on to apply the customs, mores, reasonable and settled expectations of parties in coming to a determination or a decision of how to resolve a matter in dispute. Arbitrators are given a wide latitude by the courts, which uh, under the Federal Arbitration Act and, and state uh, arbitration rules support arbitration uh, as a creature of contract, an expression of the party's freedom. Out of deference to party freedom and the nature of arbitration, courts will not vacate arbitral awards on the grounds of the state of fact or a mistake of law. Arbitrators are given a fair amount of latitude. Now, it's rare, but occasionally a court will vacate an arbitral decision based on manifest disregard for the law. But to do that, basically, the arbitrator has to essentially say, I know what the law is. I don't like the law, so I want to do something else. It's a very, very rare thing. But although it can't be vacated, on the grounds of mistake of law, we arbitrators, especially these days, have been working hard to try to follow the law when coming to decisions in arbitration. Here today, we have the benefit uh, of a source of law on fee dispute arbitration through Professor Brickman's article, which is terrific. And so we're going to be looking uh, at how Professor Brickman addresses particularly the question of the reasonableness of the fee. So in this segment, we'll be looking at the actuality of what it is that arbitrators consider and what process we use for arriving at the determination of whether and at what amount to issue an award, including whether there's a rebate of, of funds to the client. So for starters, <laughs> what is a reasonable fee? So here's a, a core expression. A fee is excessive, when, after a review of the facts, a reasonable lawyer would be left with the definite and firm conviction that the fee is excessive. The factors to be considered in determining whether a fee is excessive may include the following eight factors. So we got sort of a tautological definition to start out. It's reasonable if, if a reasonable lawyer would think it's reasonable. But let's take a look at those factors. Before we actually look at the eight factors itself, which we'll look at in a moment, we can step back and just keep one thing in mind. The fee uh, is governed uh, and the relationship of the attorney and client 
is governed by the existence of the retainer agreement. So we should, as I mentioned earlier, always keep in mind that this is a contractual relationship. So we do turn to and look at that retainer agreement to try to figure out what the fee should be. If there is not a retainer, then the lawyer theoretically could be in trouble and looking to recover. There could be a basis for not providing recovery at all if a lawyer has not done what's required under the rules of professional conduct of entering into a written retainer agreement with a client. There could be requirement of recoupment of, of even of fees paid. But there are times where, even in the absence of a writing, the panel or the law does not require waiver uh, of the fee. And some of this is contextual. For example, the basis of a relationship that's occurred over years, and it's a continuing attorney-client relationship, and they haven't entered into a retainer agreement for a particular set of tasks and other contexts, including considerations of reliance and essentially unjust enrichment, equitable considerations as well. So there's a balance. One of the beauties of being an arbitrator is that in the end, you all, we arbitrators, become the arbiters of the decision. And arbitration is not reversible on the basis of a mistake of law or mistake of fact. But of course, we try our best to do the right thing. And also here in this program, as they'll say later, if parties are not happy with the decision of the arbitrator, there is a 30-day period for going de novo to reverse the arbitrator's decision, unless the agreement between attorney and client has made it non, uh, taken away the right to go de novo. Okay. So one of the first things people will turn to when considering whether to an award and a fee, and, and often a claim that's made by counsel in court, is the account stated. And, and the basic notion of an account stated is, hey, we sent you a bill. We, we bill monthly. And you never objected. And so there is a theory that people have recovered on in, in court of account stated, where if a person has issued a bill for whatever service and there's not been objection, it's been regularly and timely issued, that itself states the account and creates a claim of entitlement to, uh, to payment. In the attorney-client relationship, this is actually not the end of the analysis. And as a practical matter, just observing arbitrations over the last 30 years, quite often arbitrators are not comfortable stopping with an account stated claim and just ending their analysis there. The relationship of the attorney and the client is a special relationship. The attorney is a fiduciary for the client and has to look out for the client's interests in a special way, the way fiduciaries look out for their interests, really beyond the interests of the lawyer, him or herself. There are considerations of equity, justice, fairness, and the general reasonableness of the fee that an arbitrator would bring to bear on whether to award a fee. So the mere uh, expression of an account stated, frankly, does not typically uh, end the analysis for arbitrators, but it's there and it's something to be alert to and, and maybe factor in oneself when looking at the whole set of circumstances in deciding the reasonableness of the fee as the arbitrator. Uh, along the lines of being a fiduciary, we do look out for the interests of the clients. And so there are, in the law of attorney-client uh, fee disputes, there are some consumerist uh, considerations to try to make sure that the client is protected. But again, this is balanced by the notion that there is a relationship in which both parties rely, and the attorney, too, relies that the attorney is going to get paid if the attorney does work, assuming the services are rendered appropriately and that the uh, and that according to their agreement, payment terms are clear and the services have been performed. So there's a balance of the consumer interests as well as the, the pure contractual interests of, of counsel. So now let's turn again to this question of what's an excessive fee. It's it, again, after a review of the facts, a lawyer of ordinary prudence, ordinary prudence, would be left with a definite and firm conviction that the fee is in excess of a reasonable fee. 
So here are those factors that were indicated by an ellipsis at, at, at one of our earlier slides. And we're going to look at them super quickly now, and then we're going to work through them and then again, kind of summarize and see where they lead us. So we consider the time and labor required, as well as the novelty or difficulty of the issues involved in the representation and the skill requisite to perform the legal service properly. The likelihood, if apparent or made known to the client, that the attorney was precluded from other employment by agreeing to represent the client in the particular matter, the fee customarily charged in the locale for similar legal services, the amount involved and the results obtained, the time limitations imposed by client or the circumstances, the nature and length of the professional relationship with the client, the experience, reputation, and ability of the lawyers performing the services, and whether the fee is fixed or contingent. These are seen as you know, eight of the core factors in considering the reasonableness of the fee. So now let's take a little closer look at some of these. So time and labor required. You know, we know that, that there are some matters that could be handled very quickly. There might be legal issues that are presented that are very complex that require research. There might be intensive briefing in, in a hotly contested matter. And so according to what the real legal tasks are, is this just spitting out a form and, and going through a simple transaction? Or is this something where, where there's really a meaningful work that needs to be done? Along those lines, the novelty or difficulty of the issues. There might be issues that, that a firm handles day after day. You spit out the same arguments you've seen. You've got the information in the bank of briefs, if it's being litigated or on the forums, and it's not novel, it's not difficult. But there are times where crafted analysis is required, where research really has to be done on very particular issues. And related to this, the skill that's requisite to perform the legal service. Is this something we could send a first-year associate out to handle? Or is this something that requires, with no experience, or is this something that requires some texture. Imagine patent counsel and assessing the uh, originality or whatever it is, developing a marksman's format, whatever it is. How complex is it and what kind of skill and experience is required in order to perform that service? Those can go into thinking about the reasonableness of the fee that's charged. Another factor is counsel precluded from other employment. They're sitting around, there's not much else to do, there's not great demand. But what if the person's highly in demand and very busy, and now the client is saying, hey, this is really urgent. You've got to work on this. And the counsel goes and works on it and says, fine, I'll give up all this other stuff, but I really have to work on that. Well, that's a factor whether one's precluded from uh, other employment. The fee customarily charged in locale for similar services. So there are sections, let's say, of New York State where fees are quite different. From, from what they are in the heart of our commercial center here in New York City. The rates will be different in different places and counsel because of pressures, because of the, the related costs, because of competition, because of what's represented, can be, be assumed to charge according to the zone that they're in. So is the fee customarily charged in the locale for similar services is a legitimate thing to think about. The amount involved and the results obtained, proportionality. So let's say there's a case, $100,000 at issue, and counsel uh, generates a million dollars of, of legal fees. Is that proportion? It's a question that at least is, is included in the factors that people consider on the reasonableness of a fee. The analysis, of course, doesn't stop there. What if a client's a very large corporation and says, we don't care how much it uh, is going to cost to litigate this thing. We're going to have, you know, a hundred, a thousand other people making the same argument against us. If, if we don't fight this point, we're just opening the floodgates for further death by a thousand cuts. So 
you take whatever you have to do, fight this thing assiduously, don't be frivolous, but do all the work that's required in order to make this point. Uh, and you can go forward and, and litigate uh, fully and powerfully. Well, under those circumstances, that was a client aware of the apparent disproportionality of the fee to the services. And so that also would be considered. In addition, notice. If one has a client and counsel says, listen, here's a projection of my budget. Here's the projected outcome. Here are some of the risks that might be considered and the likelihood of win or lose. And you see, this is going to be very expensive. But the client says, I insist, I insist, and does it with a consciousness and awareness of what's at issue. Well, that's something that an arbitrator can consider also when considering this question of proportionality. So it's not a slam dunk. You don't say, okay, what's the outcome and what's the, the cost? And if, if the cost exceeds the outcome, the, the lawyer loses the delta. That's definitely not what's intended, but it's a factor people can consider. Time limitations imposed by the client or circumstances. What if it's three days before a statute of limitations about to expire and a client shows up at one's doorstep? What if well, there's a race for some sort of a deal? and a set of contractual documents have to be prepared. The factors of time pressure that then generate a ton of work are, are things that can be considered. If the client is telling the counsel, got to do it within this time, and, and that causes greater activity within a short period of time, well, that's something people can consider, as well as circumstances. And the nature and length of the professional relationship with the client Another thing that can be considered in terms of the reasonableness of the fee. Another factor, the experience, reputation, and ability of the lawyers performing the services. We live in a legal market, marketplace. And if one wants to get the star litigator, might have to spend more money to get somebody with that level of, of reputation, which theoretically brings with it a level of experience and, and knowledge and skill, there can be differences in how much one gets paid according to experience, reputation, and the ability of the lawyers performing the services. Another factor for arbitrary to consider, all of these are always tempered by the fact that there is a retainer agreement. And if the lawyer and the client get into a relationship and for whatever reason, the client has with well-informed chosen, here's, here's counsel, and I think they're worth X. Well, that's something very much to consider, not to forget, despite these individual factors. Now, this other element, whether a fee is fixed or contingent, under our program, Part 137, we arbitrators don't handle contingent fee matters. Where we, the fee is a contingent fee, it's it's not going to be addressed within this panel. Where the fees to be paid by the client has been determined pursuant to a statute or rule or allowed as of right by the court, or where the fee has been determined pursuant to a court order, those are outside of our jurisdiction in this Part 137 program. So we're now returning again to this whole list. Just good to keep in mind that we can look at these various factors here and definitely be informed by that. But this is a holistic analysis. It's not just one thing or another thing. You don't focus over much on the time and, and labor, maybe, and ignore the time limitations or the proportionality issue or, or the reputation of counsel. It's all part of a holistic consideration when thinking about the reasonableness of the fee. So now let's say, for whatever reason, then arbitrators starting to get the sense on what's been shown is evidence-based assessments in the light of standards that this is an excessive fee. Say the arbitrator is leaning in that direction. Well, how do you figure out what's a reasonable fee? Can there be denial of some of the attorney's billing? Certainly. Can there be denial of some of the expenses claimed? Absolutely. And more fundamentally, is there a determination what's the reasonable fee in light of these factors that were listed. So now let's look at some of these related factors that go into this textured analysis. Keep in mind, first principle, what's the deal? 
What does that retainer agreement say? We're looking at an hourly rate. Also, we can consider the nature uh, and financial uh, capacity of the client. And we're saying, does this make sense? Is there something off here? Uh, the sophistication of the client. Take a very unsophisticated client that's given a retainer agreement that they're never going to understand. And it's got a ton of dollars going in a, in a certain direction. Okay, maybe that's something to consider. Again, we're, we're now having this thinking after there's already been a sense that this is an excessive fee. You know, the prudent... Ordinary lawyer of ordinary prudence is starting to say, this thing's excessive. So sophistication client and the level of work. Are we seeing a senior partner charging senior partner rates for something that could be done by a paralegal? So is a senior partner, partner, senior associate, associate, paralegal, secretary, who's doing the work? What kind of work is it? Is it appropriate? So maybe the rate should be adjusted according to who it's really appropriate for is, is the thought. How much is too much? So this is like Goldilocks and the three bears. Now what's, what's just the right amount? So in a protracted litigation where there's been a ton of fees generated, one thing to look at is who was driving those fees in the first place? Now, if someone is defending a heap of motions that the other party is bringing because they've gotten the message whether it's the zeal of counsel or the instructions of client, that other team has gotten the message, we're going to litigate this thing to death. We're going to make every motion we can possibly make. Well, what's the lawyer on the other side of that V supposed to do? Is this something that the lawyer who didn't generate that activity could reasonably control? So who's being aggressive? It's something to look at. If a lot of this is Reactive is kind of a negative term, but if this is in reaction to other things to which one has a duty to respond, well, then how do you blame that counsel for having fought hard against somebody else who's fighting super hard? Does counsel advise the client that the meter's running, send timely bills, and, and send a budget? Okay, That makes a difference. If it's getting expensive and that's been happening, that's something to consider. What was at stake? Again, this is the proportionality. What value was risked and what value was gained in this protracted litigation? Take a look at those time records and the bill descriptions. Are they over general? Are they SNP? Are they sufficiently detailed? Are they, are they reliably entered? We look at the time records. We do, in arbitration, look at the time records. Again, experience level, another thing to think about. Was this bespoke service that's crafted or were they reinventing the wheel? Were there frivolous acts by counsel? Were there court appearances that were missed and deadlines and errors? Now, one little highlight on errors, malpractice and even misconduct, if that becomes central, that is outside the jurisdiction of part 137. That could push us to a point where we shouldn't even be deciding on that because that becomes something that's excluded like a substantial question of law. So, but these are considerations for, for this question on excessiveness and how to figure out what's appropriate. Here are some favorite items, the travel time, okay? Look at the retainer. Retainer should say, you know, we get paid for travel, but even if it's omitted and it's required, it should be reasonable. You consider the length, you consider the customary practices in the area, and under the subspeaker, right, under the guise of reasonableness, when someone, a lawyer, consults colleagues, do you bill for all of them? The thought is maybe that gets a little bit much. So maybe there's one, but the consultant, but maybe not the consultees. So there is this question, again, on, on excessiveness. Court delays. You go to court, you have to sit for four hours. What do you do about that? Question whether all of that should be billed to the client. If you're sitting in court and you're doing work on another matter, double billing, that's not okay. So frivolous acts, missed court appearances, deadlines, blunders we've talked about. And sometimes people look at the costs of the other counsel. But there could be reasons why one set of lawyers charges what it charges and the other set of lawyers charges what they charge. There could be different needs, different strategies, maybe different quality, maybe different results that are being obtained. If one team is charging very little, but they keep losing, that's not necessarily the standard for what the reasonable fee is. So on disproportionality, we can look at it in light of the financial resources, 
the relief sought, we can consider complexity, but the obligation to pay, again, if we're thinking about an outcome, is not conditioned on the success of counsel. Every case has a winner and a loser. That doesn't mean that 50% of, of the lawyers don't get paid. That's not what the retainer agreement provides. That's not the, the legal relationship. Unless it's, of course, a contingent fee, it's a different story, and that's out of our, our area. So is bill padding okay? Clearly not. So you have to bill only for the hours spent, not, not for extra ones that you think you did such a great job with throwing a few extra hours because we deserve it. We did, we're so good. But people can capitalize, may capitalize on experience, reputation, skill, quality, competence, and efficiency by charging a higher rate, or people can charge flat fees in contexts. As long as it's clear and everybody knows what's covered, there's, there's no rule against it. So uh, now where the fee, moving back now to the excessiveness zone, where the fee is excessive, one may use a quantum merit type of analysis. How much is it worth? And there could be comparisons then to what's at the market and what's reasonable given all the other factors that can feed into the sense of uh, the reasonable value of the services. On expenses, travel expenses, long distance calls, messenger investigations, using an outside investigator, postage, overnight mail, copying, computerized legal research, meals, all these things ideally should be placed in the retainer agreement. If they're not there, it opens the door to the question of whether these charges may be recovered or not. So it's a warning to counsel that they should be in the retainer agreement. Again, there is this is a zone of reasonableness and predictability, understanding between client and counsel. Paralegal rates should also be in the retainer agreement. Things like overhead, secretarial services, library costs, rent, telephone, and utilities that doesn't usually get charged as an expense. And if it's being charged, that's something to wonder about. Some expenses should be borne by the client, even if it's not explicitly stated in the retainer. For example, litigation costs, like filing fees, expert witness fees, to which the client has consented. And typically, there should be a statement to the client, "This is we got to hire this expert. Here's how much it's going to cost. Are you okay with that? And court reporter costs. Those things are costs that should be borne by the client. Basically, the lawyer does not assume the costs of the litigation. That would be a champerty, and that's that's a no-no. The client's responsible for the expenses. So I think, I hope I've hit our core issues on the reasonableness of the fee. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and we'll turn it back over to you. One thing just ending to keep in mind is this whole, whole set of things that were beyond our consideration, these liminal considerations, the border, crossing the border, on malpractice, breach of fiduciary duty, misconduct, those sorts of things are really beyond us and maybe will be addressed a little bit more later in the program. So thank you again.